Welcome to State of the State. I'm Michelle Mortensen. Nevada is growing by leaps and bounds. In 2020, the census pegged the Silver State as the fifth fastest growing state in the nation. Our population has grown a whopping 15% just since 2010. But as our population grows, so does our incarceration rate. Get this, 763 out of every 100,000 people in Nevada are behind bars. And that is well above the national average. In fact, the number of people behind bars jumped a whopping 391% here in Nevada from 1983 to 2015. The amount of time prisoners are spending incarcerated has jumped 20% and recidivism is up 29%. Now, these sobering statistics are why the federal government is looking for effective prisoner reentry programs. And we have one right here in Nevada. The question is, how can the government, or anyone for that matter, truly determine if a reentry program is effective at reducing recidivism, cutting costs, and making communities safer? Well, if you're the government, you actually fund a study. And that's exactly what the DOJ has done. And they partnered with UNLV to specifically look at the effectiveness of Nevada's premier reentry program, Hope for Prisoners. And today we're actually going to uncover just how effective the program has been over the last 11 years with helping Nevada reach those specific goals. And joining me now is Dr. El is Dr. Emily Trashansky with UNLV, who helped lead this study to answer some of those questions for us. Dr. Emily, I didn't want to butcher your name, and there <laughs> in the prompter, I just did it, so please forgive me for that. <laughs> it's perfectly fine. All right, so you really focus, quite a bit of your career at UNLV is focusing on criminal justice, criminal justice reform, and, and equity and equality in criminal justice, correct? Correct, absolutely correct. So it's very safe to say this is a passion of yours. It is, yes, it always has been. And, and I'm curious, just Hope for Prisoners has been here for just about over a decade. They have been focused on reentry. Just from what you've been able to see from them and the things that you study every day, how effective of a program is this? I, From what I've seen, it's been 10 years now working with Hope for Prisoners, and I've done evaluations for them every two years, so a lot of programmatic evaluations, and they're extremely effective. Um, they lead the nation in the lowest rates of recidivism for their clients. Now, you've been checking them every two years. That's a great uh, a point where you can just see how it's grown. And, and have you seen it exponentially get better every two years? Like when you started year two, was it like, uh, not as great as it is today? What have you noticed significantly? What, what, in their growth? In their over growth, time? yeah. I feel like the leadership at Hope for Prisoners is really good about taking the evaluation data that, that I figure out or that I help put together and then figuring out their trouble spots and what kind of programs are needed for their clients, um, what kind of resources or services are needed, and then how that they, they can best partner with other community organizations. So the leadership, John's really, really great about um, looking at where they're failing or they might be failing like 10 years ago, and then creating routes to um, success based off of that. So I've watched their training programs develop over the last 10 years where First, they had two tracks. Now it's 10 tracks, right? So they've um, increased the access to different sorts of work and employment opportunities for their clients. I've also watched them um, increase the amount of access that they have or partnerships with other community organizations, which leads to better success rates overall. And then they've also been really great about growing their mentorship program. So that's um, a component of Hope for Prisoners that I think is really unique and really, really important. They've been able to grow their staff as well. So they have more case managers and programmatic staff. They have mental health therapists. They've got um, drug and alcohol addiction therapists now. So they've been able to grow um, in response to what they know that their clients need, which I think is why they've been so successful over 10 years. And, and one of the interesting things for me when I looked at this study is I know as well that Hope for Prisoners has really grown a lot in the last decade yes. and that they are doing such great work and yes. they have one of the lowest recidivism rates in the country. I guess what was a stark contrast was some of those numbers I gave to you right off the top where it appears Nevada, once again, is at the bottom of a list, and this is one we don't want to be on once again, where incarceration is up, the time that you're in is up, and the going back is up. So explain to me that. That's a that's a stark parallel. We started this segment, and it was, oh, 
this is bad. Yeah. But what Hope for Prisoners is doing is so well. So what's going on? There's a disconnect. Yeah, there's a disconnect. I think what Nevada Department of Corrections has been doing, there's been lots of changes in leadership over the last 10 years, and they've been trying to do different things and see what works best for the state. So um, I, I feel like a lot of the shifts with populations with inmate populations and rates of recidivism are due primarily to um, changes or inconsistency with Nevada Department of Corrections. But I also feel like it's also part of the problem that as a community, there's 2.4 million people here in this valley, right? We don't have a lot of community organizations dedicated to this um, population of persons. And you can say that across the state. You can say that about, um, homeless shelters, halfway houses, domestic violence shelters, right? So we don't have a lot of those services to help these populations of persons. So I feel like that's part of the larger conversation of the problem of the state. And I would imagine that another aspect that probably people don't like to talk about is that our biggest economic factor is really gaming. Yes. So that's gaming and drinking and there's prostitution and everything that's kind of associated oh, with yeah. that, which is probably triggers for people who just got out of prison, correct? Yes, correct. And then it's a 24 seven lifestyle. So you have access to all of these, these things 24 right. seven. And yeah, that all plays a part to it. So it's not like doing prisoner reentry in Iowa. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so in that respect, Nevada is very, very unique. It and is then very unique. I think that also does speak very highly then of the effectiveness of what Hope for Prisoners has done. Would I you agree. concur? I definitely agree with that. Because I noticed in the report that you did, so for many years, Hope for Prisoners was able to brag a, a 6% recidivism rate. 6.8, yeah. 6.8. And in this new report, though, that recidivism rate has gone up to 12%. Yes. But this study was also done during COVID. Yeah, 2020 and 2021. Yeah. So I wanted to go over a few numbers here. It looks like um, during this time, they took in more than 264 people. And in that time, two graduates were reincarcerated. Both were not convicted, only arrested and reincarcerated. Six were reincarcerated for parole violations and 10 were at Casa Grande. That's a transitional I kind of look at it as you're still in jail, but you're kind of in this transitional exactly. housing yeah. and you get to leave and go to work and come back. But exactly. they had some trustee status issues. Correct. So when we're really looking at those numbers, they were really good. Yeah. I mean, if you're just looking at when we're talking about recidivism, right? So if um, like my grandparents, right? So older normal americans when they think of recidivism it's actually the committance of a new crime right right so a new crime you're arrested on a new crime and you go back to prison um here we have clients and this is not unique to nevada this is happening all across the country where only two of them were actually arrested for a new crime they weren't charged right so we're still tracking them but they were arrested for a new crime just two two out of 264. yeah and then that we had six that are getting parole technical violations. So they're under the rules of probation and parole, and they are going back to the yard, back to prison, usually because of a diluted UA. So not a dirty UA yet, but a diluted UA. Um, many of them get curfew violations or they don't show up where they're supposed to be. So whatever rules are governing them on their parole sentence, um, there's a violation there. So six people went back because of a parole violation. And then of the people that are living at Costa Grande, which is Nevada Department of Corrections, um, 10 of them are violating a Costa Grande rule. So again, that's very similar to parole rules. It's just that these 10 people are living at Costa Grande. Yeah. So we have 16 folks that are going back because of a rule violation or a technical violation, and only two that were actually arrested on a new crime. And if we think back, I know it's 2022 now, and it's hard to remember 2020. Obviously, none of us forget. But if you can remember what life was like in March and April and May, there were no jobs. The prisons were letting people out very early with no place to go, no right. halfway houses, right. no no programs. Right. Um, regular people who've never spent a day in jail were drinking excessively, getting drugs excessively, uh, falling back. It was a tough time. It was a very tough time, yeah. For the community as a whole. Yep. So again, while some people might nitpick at these numbers, they actually show that this program is working. Yeah, yeah. So what in particular is working that other programs around the country have kind of like, what's their secret sauce that Hope for Prisoners has that other people are missing out on? Yeah, I think during COVID, what 
I thought was really, really amazing of this organization. They were able to get technology and have classrooms and services through internet and through technological services to their clients that were on pre-release. So they were, or sorry, their clients that they were um, engaging with before they were released. So Hope for Prisoners has this wraparound program where they're inside the system for pre-release and then they help with the re-entry side on post-release. That makes them very unique that they're able to do that. But during COVID, because they were still able to give clients access to services and programs through this technological innovation that they that they were able to utilize. Utilize and collaborate with through the Department of Corrections. So yeah. that was a wonderful thing that NDOC did, right, in collaboration with Hope for Prisoners. Um, so I think because there was still this way to get clients services and care through COVID, even if they were being released and they didn't have infrastructures or homes or safe spaces or even jobs, it was very difficult for them to get jobs as well. They still had some kind of a connection to an organization that was gonna help them get through this time together. Correct, and I, I noticed that during the COVID time, they would do, so one thing that I hope for prayers prisoners does is the things called huddles yeah uh, throughout they the week. started huddles yeah they started huddles and and huddles are usually done in person when you're in the program but during covid they really did it um via zoom yeah. and social media and other ways yeah. and what was so nice was when you know everyone was cut off from society and people couldn't come and visit at casa grande anymore or you know you couldn't get out of your house because we were on lockdown you were having community with the people who you were in your graduating class with yep. but also i remember there were some instances at casa grande where like a daughter would be watching on facebook as well yeah. so there was almost like that familial contact yep. Yep. and you couldn't see each other and you couldn't talk but you knew that your daughter or your husband or, yep. or someone else in your family was there yep. And that gave, you could just watch it give so much hope. It did, yeah. I think it was really transformative during that time, during COVID, right? To ha yeah. have this sense or this feeling that we're all on the same page virtually, but at least there's some kind of connection and community happening. So are you noticing then in the other programs that go around the country, are they not as effective as creating that community? I, from the programs that I know throughout the country, there's a lot that do really, really good community work. I think the hallmark of Hope for Prisoners is that the vision from the top down is so consistent. So leadership, the board, all of the programmatic staff, all of the case managers, anybody that walks through those doors understands the vision and the plan and the goal here is not to just make sure this one client is good, right? For themselves, but to make sure that this client is good for themselves because we're all a community supporting one another. And I think the focus on the individual as part of this larger unit and community that's embraced um, is very, very unique. Like I think their mentorship model is amazing and very unique. I don't see a lot of mentorship models like that across the country at reentry. Interesting. Now, this is something that that John Ponder really did create. Yes. And and John was incarcerated. He makes no bones about that. And so sometimes there's a lot of, well, it's because of John and John's unique experience and John's passion and John's heart. So that asks the question then, is it a success here because of John or is this something that can be replicated? I think it can easily be replicated. Yeah, and I think that's a good um, goal for the future is to think about how does experiential knowledge, right? So somebody like John, and there's thousands of people, right, that have this incarcerated experience, and how can they work with other similar humans with that same experience? There's programmatic staff and case managers at Hope for Prisoners that also have this experience. And when I talk to clients, um, so I've been doing interviews with clients, I've done 50 now, and when I talk to them, and I asked them, like, why do you think it's successful? They always say that it's because they understand where I'm coming from. They've been there. And I've seen them. I now know that I can be successful because I see that there's success, that it's attainable, right? Right. So I think that that's a beautiful model. And I think it's really transformative for the clients to see that and experience that. But then it's also, I think, really beautiful for leadership and for the case managers and programming staff because they have this knowledge of like, I know where you're at right now, I've been there and I'm gonna help you do whatever it takes to make sure that you're successful. One of the things as a journalist that's very important to me is always learning from history. And normally we get to learn from that over a great deal of time, but COVID was so recent. And I feel during the heart of COVID because of fear, a lot of decisions were made that in hindsight we can say, hmm, not so sure about that. One of that was releasing prisoners and we released prisoners due to fear of COVID and it traveling within the system. 
but we did so without a place for them to get a job, a place for them to live, kind of setting people up to fail. So whether you didn't like it because you're letting prisoners out early and that you feel that that wasn't right, or you were letting them out with a place to go, that could also be an issue. And I noticed that in the data that you had, 21% were homeless. Were homeless. Yeah, coming out, they were homeless, yeah. So that's not as much a DOJ problem or, or, or a direct, direct Department of Corrections or Hope for Prisoners problem, that's your community. Yeah, it's a structural problem, yeah. And so in your opinion, a lot of people, when they say, oh, there's gonna be a halfway house built in our neighborhood, you know, they're up in arms because they're like, yo, I don't want those folks there. I've got two little girls. Would I be very upset if there were a bunch of sex offenders there? I probably would as a mom. I'm just being transparent and honest. But I also know at the same time, you need these types of places and they can't all be in the worst part of town where Correct. they can go out on the corner. And that's like having halfway houses in the heart of Hollywood by the Hollywood sign, right? Is that super helpful? Not really. Yeah. So, so how do we fix that structural problem? Because it's not just structural, it's community. Yeah. Their opinions. Yes, yeah. I think fixing the structural problem at the state level and then at the county local level means um, investing in community resources to build and make sure that we have um, safe places, safe houses for previously incarcerated folks to reside at. Um, another, th another thing that I think is really important is to make sure that the price of rent is affordable. So right now, there's a problem because we have inflation going on and price of rent is also increasing. So even if you were previously incarcerated or not, it's really difficult for a range of human beings to pay bills, to go to the grocery store and to pay rent, right? So it's a larger issue at the federal level, but then I think what we can do locally is make sure that we are building or renovating places that are safe and affordable for previously incarcerated folks and their families, right? Um, so many clients that I talk to, like housing is always an issue and Hope for Prisoners works really, really hard to make sure that they find housing for their clients. But we have moms that have um, kids that they're trying to get back from the foster care system. Right. And that means that you have to have another bedroom, right? Which means it's more money in rent. And then similarly, moms wanna make sure that they're in a safe neighborhood because they want their kids back. So, um, it's not only about making sure that we have housing available, but safe and affordable housing, which I think we can do if we divert money and make a community investment and say like, this is a priority. If we want our communities to be safe, then we need to make sure that we have affordable, safe housing. It's interesting though, because of the workforce connections mm -hmm. that Hope for Prisoners has been able to create, and right. I don't know how great it is at other programs, but I, I know specifically for Hope that they've been able to get reincarcerated people into good paying jobs. Yes. So you're not like flipping burgers at McDonald's right. for 15 bucks an hour. Right. They're either, you know, building the Raiders stadium or they have high paying jobs at Stations Casino. And there's a quality there where some of the folks that I've interviewed, because I've interviewed a lot of their graduates as well. Yeah. Some of them are making more money than I did at my at my top. Yeah. You know, and yep. they got out of prison five years ago. Yep. So let's talk about that for a minute. That's highly effective. It's extremely effective. And I think what Hope for Prisoners does, they have this language around like, we we want to build careers. We wanna make sure that our clients are happy in a career that they love and that they can grow in, right? We wanna make sure that they're paid well. We wanna make sure they have health insurance. Um, instead of a meantime job, because right. we don't want people bouncing around from these meantime jobs. So there's a commitment here with this organization to sit and talk to clients and find out what they're passionate about or what they what they have experiences in, if they have any kind of work experience or what their dreams are, their visions are for themselves for the future. And then there's this dedication to making sure that it's not just a meantime job, it's a career that pays really well so you can be financially independent on your own in the future. So you can provide for your families. And so you can be a collaborative, good community member and give back as well. It's interesting to me because John, if you know John and you know Hope for Prisoners well, you, you know the term vivid vision. Yes. And that does not surprise you at all. No. Now to some folks who may watch this, they'll be like, vivid vision, what are you talking about? Well, after you go through your first week of the program, you basically write a vision for your life. And then after you have that vision a year later, they check and see like, hey, what have you accomplished? And I can't tell you how many times I have heard. Yeah, I'm getting goosebumps. Oh, yeah. They accomplish every darn thing. Yes. And more. Yeah. 
Yeah, many of them do, yeah. So they call the organization hope, but there's something secret about the way they are able to instill actual hope yeah. for a real future. Yes. So much so that they don't want to re-offend. Right. I don't know that that's happening in many places. It's, I, I haven't seen that part happening in many places. Like most reentry organizations have short and immediate goals, right? Um, Hope for Prisoners has short, immediate, and then these long-term goals where they're really dedicated to their clients and making sure that their vivid vision does come to fruition in the future. And when you talk to clients, you find out that um, they love their case managers because they say, you know, they keep me accountable. They know the goals that I have for this month. They check on me. And then when I'm able to complete these goals, like I feel some level of like accomplishment and success just for this one goal that I had for this one month. Right. Yeah. And if you do that over the course of 18 months to two years, the amount of things that humans can accomplish with support is, is absolutely amazing. Yeah. So I would say that's probably the one thing. Now, in your studies, do you only look at Hope for Prisoners or do you also look at the other places around the country? I am not able to go to the other places and do an evaluation. OK, but I read the research on other programmatic evaluations coming out of other states. And there's some states that are doing really good work. And then there's some states that aren't. So, so it's I've always and I don't know if I've always just done this because of my relationship with Hope Prisoners, but I've always considered it one of the premier yeah. prison reentry programs in the country, maybe one of the number one, number two. Do you concur? They're, from all of the evaluations that I've done, their rates of recidivism, like actual recidivism, people actually committing a new crime and going back are so low compared to other reentry programs, the national average, the state average here, that it's, it, it's mind, I mean, it's mind blowing. It's a, it's a testament to how successful the organization is. Since you kind of study criminal justice mm -hmm. and, and, and so many of these issues, I, I don't know if you're, do you have a psychology, psychiatrist type of background as well? No, it's criminology and law. Background. Criminology and law background. Because I was just curious if there is a psychological element to it in that you're able to give hope to keep hanging on to, whereas in so many systems, I mean, I, I've been in prisons before as a journalist mm -hmm. and I've done prison interviews as a journalist mm -hmm. and I've done things with Hope for Prisoners, but so much of how I color what prisoners, prison is like, right, is from TV. Orange is the New Black, Oz, you know, whatever. And it's not a very great place where there's a lot of hope. So I just wondered if there is a psychological element that really is so important to making this work. Yeah, I think that there is. And I, I was just at this conference and I was sat on a lot of panels and heard recent research. And there is this movement to understanding the psychology of what is it like to be incarcerated and that feeling and then coming out during your reentry experience. And what do you have to... Um, go through to make sure that you feel accepted, that you feel wanted and needed in the community, which is all very psychological, right? Right. So a lot of the classes, or not a lot, but there's classes that Hope for Prisoners has, that they do run, and it is about this cognitive change, right? So how can we help people the minute that they're, they come out, and then how can we stay with them through this 18 months to make sure that they're processing, that they're experiencing the emotions that they have in a safe, safe space? in a safe space where parole officers, police officers aren't there to listen to them, right? So Hope for Prisoners is this really affirming safe space for clients to come out and experience all of these psychological changes that they're having. One of the things you had to have noticed is how great the relationship between Metro and these formerly incarcerated people are. And, and normally, once you've been incarcerated, you freaking hate the police. You hate corrections officers, and here they are giving hugs, and every time they say Metro, our friends. That's phenomenal. Yeah, and that is unique to this program as well. That is. So yeah. you're not seeing that everywhere else? No, they, Hope for Prisoners was really the first to um, have this really warm and welcoming partnership with um, Metro. And now we're seeing it in other spaces. But I, I believe Hope for Prisoners was really the first to kind of put it on the mark. And, and that's hugely significant because when you're able to look at the police as not your enemy but as your friend i'm assuming that does change from a criminal mindset how you function in life thereafter yeah i think it's it's part of that but then it's also part of this understanding that we're all human beings and we all want to make sure that we're all safe in our community yeah right so i think when humans can understand that you know humans that are working for law enforcement want the same thing that we do for our families then when you have that similar um, 
view of what community should look like and what success is for us, which is safety, making sure that you're doing well, that you have a job, that you have a roof over your head, then those walls around us, other law enforcement, criminal, right? Those kind of yeah. go away. You know, uh, prisoner reentry and prison reform has just been a hot topic over the past, let's say, five years or so. Very hot topic. Yeah. And it's become um, a very uh, partisan topic, believe it or not. Yeah. yeah. And what's interesting is you could be on the far left or you could be on the far right and you're for this. But there's a bunch of people in the middle who are like, I don't know what to really think. But as someone who's studied criminal justice your whole life, ultimately isn't the goal of criminal justice to if you've committed a crime you're going to pay a price for that crime but then having that ability to re-enter safely into society that was always the goal wasn't it yes it was never to just keep people locked up for now some people we have to admit they just love to reoffend, 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 and they don't want to change we could admit that right i mean i think that for humans that have a difficult time um, in changing, it's more about their psycho psychopathy then. Okay. So um, then I, I, I feel like then there should be different institutions for that type of a criminal. Right. I, when I think of like uh, Jeffrey Dahmer or people like that, like exactly. I, I don't think there was any hope for prisoner program that exactly. was going to work for them, right? Exactly. They, they definitely needed something else. But for for many prisoners, this is the ultimate goal, to, to pay your price to society and yeah. then come at back and yeah. be, a, you know, made whole. But I guess throughout time, We've never really seen that work, have we? No, we haven't. But right now, we're seeing, a, we're seeing a resurgence of it. And we actually do have it here in Nevada. Yeah, we're seeing a resurgence of it. And then we're having these conversations, these bipartisan conversations, which are really important, especially because throughout this country and then within our state, so many inmates are there for a drug addiction, drug and alcohol addiction, drug conviction. Um, so we're having these conversations now around mental health and addictions, right? And is there alternatives to incarceration? And if we are going to incarcerate them, then can we get them services on the inside to make sure that they understand um, what led them there? Right, exactly. And, and hopefully those services will become more available because if we're able to really target particularly drug addiction and things of that nature while they're incarcerated, the chances are exponentially exponentially higher. Yeah. So I know we started the show on a Debbie Downer and we've kind of done the up and down. So maybe just kind of address if you can, while those statistics are so sobering about Nevada, the statistics about hope for prisoners are so amazing and so high. Yes. So when are we going to see those things converge where our incarceration numbers or recidivism numbers go down and we're going to be able to directly attribute it to the success of things like hope for prisoners. Mm -hmm. So when will that when will that happen? Yeah. Hopefully soon. <laughs> um, I think if we look at what Hope for Prisoners is doing as an organization, and if we can do that as a community, a larger community or a state, right? Making sure that people that are coming out have mental health care, addiction care if they need it, have housing if they need it, have a mentorship program or some kind of community where they feel like they belong, where they're not being judged, right? If we can do what Hope for Prisoners is doing locally within our communities and within the state, then I feel like rates of recidivism, like actually committance of a new crime and going back would drop, would drop. I think the interesting thing that I'm gonna look at in the future is what is it about the technical violations and the rule violations? And if somebody gets a technical violation or a rule violation, does it really make our community safer? And is it economically feasible for us to keep locking them in? Kind of like, is it a nanny rule? Like yeah. you did something benign, like you didn't make your bed or yeah. did you go and yeah. get high, yeah. right? right? Okay. Got Especially it. if it's about drugs. Like if it's a dirty UA, then do we really need to be sending them back because they're not gonna get services on the inside? Or is there an alternative where they can go? And what do you mean by dirty UA, I guess? Like um, if they have a urinary analysis where okay. it comes up that they're using drugs. Got it, got it. So if you're on parole, that's a violation, it's a new crime. And same thing with Costa Grande. So if we find out that they're using again when they're out, then is it in their best interest to go back in? Is it in our community's best interest, especially the price, like what we pay for to incarcerate humans, right? right? Or is there an alternative? Like, can we get them care 
addictions care, drug and alcohol addiction care somewhere else. Wonderful. Okay, yeah. that's great. Well, I'm glad to know that Hope for Prisoners is such an effective program. And I'm glad to know that we have people like you who are actually helping us keep accountable. So even though, you know, Thank we you. say Department of Justice studies, oh, wah, 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 it's kind of boring and let's look at data. It's data like this that can really change re-entry, not only here in Nevada, yeah. but across the nation. Yeah. So thank you. Thank yeah. you so much for your service. Thank you so much. All right. And thank you for joining us here today as well. Remember, we are battle born and it's shows like this one that make us battle ready. I'm Michelle Mortensen. I'll see you next time.